respond to uh, transcriptions of foreign words, what distinction am I even making between loan words and transcriptions of foreign words? I think it's not a, a, a firm distinction you can make, but that you know, in our own lives, we know, am I saying uh, restaurant uh, to, as an English word, <laughs> or am I saying, you know, pratitya uh, samutpada as a as a sort of uh, technical one-off, uh, you know, transcription of a foreign word. Just to give you an overview, then we have uh, transcriptions of foreign words in Western Han historical texts. Then we have the Bailanga, which is a uh, three poems in a Sino-Tibetan language uh, that were transcribed into Chinese characters, but still in the Bailang language uh, in the Han Dynasty. Uh, and then we have the earliest uh, Indic transcriptions. Uh, and then we have Eastern Han Buddhist transcriptions. So these are in chronological order, right? Uh, and, and basically, the, the Western Han is the first time that Chinese civilization becomes, you know, routinely in contact with other civilizations from which we have written records. Yeah. Uh, and then we have some later Indic transcriptions. Okay. So uh, transcriptions in Western Han historical texts. Uh, and then I, what I'm planning to do here is kind of talk you through one or two examples in detail and then just give you long lists to look at uh, with some overall observations. Yeah, so let's uh, look at uh, this. So there's a place, and I never know how to pronounce it in English. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> okay. Well, it's Chorism or Chorism. Yeah, okay. And they use it every moment. Well, yeah, my problem is. Yeah, okay. Well, um, and where is it? You know the Arrow Sea? Yeah, okay. So, which country is it in now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll say it's in Greater Persia. In I, I would North say East Greater Persia. Yeah. I would, um, if I can interject, I would say Khwarezm and I would say it's in uh, uh, Eastern Uzbekistan. Eastern Uzbekistan. Okay. So Khwarezm in Eastern Uzbekistan. So if we just read the certain characters in Old Chinese, we get. Uh, and then if we use uh, Schuttler's Han Dynasty reconstruction, uh, which is the first time we're looking at it. So far, we've only looked at Middle Chinese, uh, which is basically philologically attested, and backstream so far Old Chinese. Uh, but now we're talking about the Han Dynasty, and there are these kind of off-the-shelf Han Dynasty reconstructions from Axel Schuttler, so why not use them? Uh, and then he uh, reconstructs this as Huan uh, Xiang, yeah? Uh, and then it's uh, about uh, 107 BC is when we when we get this uh, in the historical record. Yeah. So some observations. Uh, it looks like by you know 107 BC that this uh, voiceless labio uvular that was originalized <laughs> uh, has changed into who. Yeah. Already and that the om. Uh, this sort of labial assimilation, which is this thing that happens in Vine, uh, it already happened. Yeah? Um, and uh, it points that to it being the case that the change out of the un had not yet happened. Right? So this is, I think, uh, why the, this, this evidence is really useful is it can both kind of confirm aspects of our reconstruction and tell us about the, the historical, uh, the, the absolute chronology of these sound changes. Uh, okay. So, so then now I'm just proposing what we, we think it maybe would have been uh, pronounced like. So I just changed the N to an R basically in, in Schuttler's reconstruction and we get quite a zero. Okay. So uh, the next one is, uh, is uh, this place, Paramita. I, I, I will stop soliciting your geographical knowledge, because <laughs> it will just slow us down. Uh, and uh, this, I think, ever so tentatively, uh, but Guillaume Jacques actually independently uh, proposed it uh, uh, and, and had already written a blog post about it uh, when I mentioned it to him as an idea. 
Um, so, so if you think it's a bad idea, blame him. <laughs> but the, again, it's about the placement of the R, where uh, Baxter's uh, cigar we can start to talk, uh, but since we are allowing ourselves to move their R's from medial to initial position, maybe we can reconstruct it as uh, as ta rumit, yeah. Uh, but you know, if you feel like that's overdoing it, uh, I would be okay with that. Uh, but another thing it can potentially do is confirm that the T was a T. Although uh, you could also say, look, when they put the T after a I vowel in brackets, what they're saying is it could be a T or it could be a K. So it could also be that the sound change it to it had already happened by this time. So in any case, it either confirms the T or it confirms the dating of the it to it change. Uh, and then I just mentioned that it suggests rma rather than mra. Uh, so then we can maybe say it was uh, pronounced tarmit. Yeah, so uh, that would be a good, and this is the citation for uh, Guillaume Jacques uh, blog post. Okay, uh, now, Alexandria, this is a fun one. This is, yeah, this is a fun one. So uh, in old Chinese, according to Baxter Cigar, it would be Alex Rai, yeah? Which mm -hmm. means like, it may, may be a little bit more than what we mean. Uh, by, by the late long period in Axel Simpler's reconstruction would be A Yik uh, Shan Liai. Uh, so, what do we have here? We have that this nra had already changed to sa or to sha, actually, the rest of us. Uh, that the R to N final was already complete. So, you know, if we just trust the evidence we're talking about here, then this one, the this this one says that the R was still R in 107 BC, uh, but then th this one. Uh, tells us that by 36 BC, the R changed into an N. Now, I think that would be overdoing it. We actually uh, have another option, which is just to say that Baxter and Cigar are incorrect in reconstructing a final R in this word, which may be a better solution, I think. But in any case, I'm just saying, what do we see in front of us? We may have evidence that I to R had already happened, uh, although, again, I think it's too early for that uh, for other reasons, which is, which is why I have question marks after those. Uh, but uh, something that I think is convincing is that L to Y inside B syllables had not yet happened, right? So that this would actually be a let san right? And not uh, a, a yet. Uh, oh, and that's, the, yeah, so I say it's a let san Now, I would really like to have this L be a D, right? But there's no way I can get it, yeah? Even though some Ls sometimes change into Ds in the history of Chinese. It's not going to work in this book. So uh, instead, we have to maybe have some story about it, about the actual form that they were trying to approximate. Where would this be? Well, it's the, not in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe another language in between. Yeah. No, there, there's apparently that Alex, that Alexander, you know, peopled all the world with towns named after him. And this is also in Central Asia, somewhere in, in Gandhar or something. I don't know. Uh, Pulley Blank uh, and then uh, before him, Paul Paleo are the ones who did the sort of philology to make these identifications. Okay, so now, uh, since we've already run across uh, two questions uh, or, or two instances where we're interested in the question of reconstructed final R, which I'll say is uh, one of the more controversial parts of Baxter's cigar system, is something they get from uh, Sergei Starostin. Let's just look at all the R's in Han, uh, Western Han historical texts. So here they are, uh, you know, you can, well, you'll get the slide or whatnot, uh, but uh, we have all sorts of Sogdia and Greek and, uh, you know, Parthia is in there and whatnot. Uh, and then you see that uh, sometimes they reconstruct an R, uh, sometimes they reconstruct an R in brackets, sometimes they reconstruct an N in brackets. So, uh, I don't know. I thought I would throw this evidence together and let you look at it. Yeah. Uh, and then there are some interesting things like this one where they think it's a n, but at least, you know, if it writes the word Kyrgyz, and again, you know, 
barring people knowing more than I do about uh, under what circumstances they they heard this word, uh, you would expect both to be R's, right? Uh, which is quite a change. I I think it is allowed by their by their uh, by their brackets because na merges with na and na merges with ra. So uh, in, in this phonetic environment, so I think you could reconstruct here for here. Uh, okay, so uh, this is Western Han. Some people would have liked nuclear energy. Well, for me, yeah, they were no longer available. Well, so I, I think, think that wouldn't have been available anymore in Chinese. Yeah, yeah. yeah but maybe the, um, what is the pharyngealization might be more important because that's, that's often the constructed for the stereo vowels that they originally. Um, retracted tongue with vowels, which are more like pharyngealized vowels. And well, and as I mentioned, actually around this time period, uh, the loans into probably around this time period in Hmong Nen, uh, the type A velars are borrowed as uvulars. So these actually may have been pronounced as uvulars uh, in, in, in this moment in Chinese history. That's what we said. When we figured out pharyngealization, the uvulars must have been. Uh, that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, Baxter and Tagar, you know, actually reconstruct. Uh, so now, just to sort of say this explicitly, Baxter and Tagar, the way they handle type AB distinction is with pharyngealization in type A. Yeah. Uh, but I think we can't actually have that be the answer in oldest Chinese. And I think, I think they think this uh, as well, because then we would have a uh, we would have pharyngealized and non-pharyngealized velars and uvulars, and I don't think that works. Yeah. So instead, I think that A B has to be sort of some mysterious distinction at the time that we actually have a velar uvular distinction, and then once the let's say the uvular is turned into fricatives, uh, then the type A B distinction maybe does become pharyngealization, and at that time a pharyngealized K is pronounced as uvular. Yeah. So we have sort of primary uvulars and secondary uvulars, if you like. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, Western Han evidence for final R, and then here's Western Han evidence for final N, and it's not you know Western Han evidence for final N in general. It's Western Han evidence for final N where Baxter and Cigar reconstruct R, which is say I think you, one way or another these two slides need to be dealt with, right? So um, so and, and this is again as we as we saw, I think that. Um, uh, as in Alexandria, the, 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 the mountain word probably didn't end uh, with an R. Yeah, personally, I, I don't think the evidence that they bring uh, for that R is convincing. Um, and uh, I would also like to suggest that this uh, identification, uh, and I'm not doing like this, I'm not, I haven't looked at uh, back at the secondary literature in Central Asian history, uh, but this uh, Isidonis, I don't think is correct because in Bailong, uh, uh, I think that we still have a slug in this case. So it's not a z, I think it's a still slug in this period. So that I wonder whether this uh, identification is correct. Yeah. Now you, you may rightfully feel annoyed with me that I'm sort of presuming you all know all of Chinese historic chronology when, when I'm going through this. But again, I'm, I'm sort of doing that on purpose and I hope it's not too painful uh, because I think, it, you know, first you need to actually get familiar with what the evidence that's available is. Uh, and in the course of that, you of course see sort of all of historic Chinese historical chronology. Uh, but then uh, once you know the tools at your uh, disposal and have kind of seen other people use them, then you're in a better position to kind of, in, in a sense, actually start uh, from the ground up yourself. Yeah. So that's uh, where we end in our available time. So I will I'll forget you saw this slide and <laughs> uh, leave it uh, with this one about uh, evidence of places where maybe uh, we should definitely have an end. Yeah. So in an army, those who don't say both get both in vowels and the distinction. Yeah, there's no way uh, in terms of Middle Chinese to distinguish final R and final N. Both get rotated. No, neither gets rotated. It's it's medial R is reloaded. And final 
That's correct. That's why. Well, it might be that it, that it was already gone by then, right? That, 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 that it, it, and um, the, the evidence for reconstructing it is that it seems like in, in Eastern dialects, it changed not into N, but into Y. So there's certain kinds of like uh, dialect variation evidence, uh, Chechen contact evidence uh, that, that, that we have sort of three classes of finals, the real ends, the real yas, and the kind of n ya confusion zone, yeah? And actually, I think the, the one way of understanding the disagreement in the field is Baxter and Cigar think that's a real, that, that zone of confusion has, has boundaries, whereas other people say like, oh, you know, ya, no, kind of similar. So uh, we don't need to reconstruct a third thing. Yeah. So we're still in a Western Han historical text, so we're looking at uh, foreign words written in Western Han historical text, uh, and I went through a couple in detail, uh, and then now I'm going through them a little bit more quickly to highlight certain, you know, linguistic features. And this one is uh, that the Middle Chinese Chusheng, uh, that's a, uh, uh, it's an entering tone, or is it the, the, <laughs> the English names mixed up? Uh, the departing tone. No, Rujang is entry tone. So it's the departing tone. Yeah. 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 Because true. Yeah. Of course. It's the right. So uh, the departing tone of Middle Chinese uh, was an S, is, is the idea we're exploring. So we look at these uh, words, and uh, Kashmir was something like Jaspin in uh, this is in Axel Schussler's late on reconstructions, which come from uh, two books by him, one from 2000. Seven one from two thousand nine. Uh, so uh, we have uh, you know Kaspin, Kushan or Kushan, Kalas or Kalas, uh, which is you know the river uh, that much later in this period would be the battle between the Arabs and the and the Tang. Yeah. Uh, another way of spelling Kushan, and then of course our Aspetita word again. Yeah. Uh, where there we you know there's a so, you know, so, so uh, to kind of avoid the perception of circularity, imagine that we don't have S over here. We have like a big X where all the S's are. And we ask ourselves, what is it that the Chushong is writing? Then we would come up with S by looking at all these S's on the right. Yeah. yeah. So um, these S's, we Chushong. Shangsheng is love stuff, is what people say. But actually, the evidence for that is much more murky. I think this is pretty, I think this is as good as it gets, basically, right? And they all, also write in love So the coda is the uh, Generally speaking, so, so let me just repeat the question for those of you online. The question is Does rhyming keep track of tone or Final S and and the the simple answer is no. Like uh, like uh, in old Chinese poetry, uh, at for instance and at are allowed to rhyme. Yeah, but the more complicated answer is they were. You know, my my impression is that like when the poet was able to keep track of it, like like it wasn't you know. It was like hot, hot and hot was considered a valid rhyme, but hot and hot was considered a better rhyme. <laughs> right? That's that's my impression of uh, the shirjing. So so on the one hand, like we shouldn't use whether or not things rhyme in old Chinese to decide whether or not there was a final S, right? But um, but it does seem like. Uh, it was a linguistic reality, so they they did like to um, rhyme, or 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 maybe even better, you know, ox with ox is also, a, a, you know, these kind of pure rhymes are better rhymes than this, yeah. And I think this is, you know, like uh, I don't know. Th th there's on the one hand, I've been promoting for through the whole course. We need, you know, we need precise hypotheses that we stick to despite all counter evidence, right? 
uh, that's, I think, in a sense, how we make progress in, in science, yeah? But on the other hand, also, you know, all Chinese poets were human beings and were trying to write poets, poems that, that were not purely demonstrations of phonology, right? They were works of art. Uh, and you can back yourself into a corner or you can try and show off and, and, and we expect some kind of variation there, right? Uh, but I think that the question is, uh, a, a good phonetic hypothesis is something that in the hands of the literature people becomes useful, right? So that if you see a funny rhyme or something, then someone will say, oh, the reason why the funny rhyme is here is because in the love story that's being described, blah, 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 yeah, which is the stuff I never do because I, you know, well, because I have totally the wrong training for it. But, um, but I think that that's, um, yeah. At, at some level, there should be uh, uh, the literature, the study of literature and the phonology should usefully cross pollinate. And that's like only the tiniest signs of that are starting to happen now uh, with the analysis of rhyme actually in, in prose. Kind of, I would say, like, you know, like uh, Shakespeare writes in, in blank verse, uh, but then every once in a while he throws in a historic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, what do they call it? A heroic couplet. Yeah, like at the end of a speech, where it's like at the end of a speech, at the end of a scene or something, when someone's like, you know, then they'll have a, a heroic couplet at the end, right? So in a similar way, uh, Chinese, uh, sort of warring states, Chinese prose uh, rhymes for sort of rhetoric as a rhetorical device now and then. Uh, and I think that's one area where, where just very recently, uh, the study of literature people have had, and, the, and the historical phonologists have had useful interactions, but anyhow, I'm slightly distracted myself. Uh, and I have answered your question, I think, yeah? Okay. okay. We also have some questions? Yeah. So a syllable like loss, would it ever rhyme with lie? Yeah. That's the idea. For some reason, probably why you ask, I feel like that is, you know, pox rhyming like pots rhyming with pots feels better to me than love rhyming with loves, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but no, I, I, it, at least for the purposes of this class, there shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, so then here is uh, um, another. This is this is a crazy observation of mine, but I will. Okay. I, yeah. What was this? Uh, the borrowing sounds. There were. Was there any uh, evidence for finding out this? We looked at the initials. Also. Oh, we. This is the first time you are being introduced to, to find this. Yeah, but well, I not the reconstruction, but I mean with evidence from outside. Yeah, yeah. It, you find, so we only looked at two kinds of evidence so far, right? Um, well, let's say three kinds. Yeah, one is uh, one is the structure of the Chinese uh, character itself, which is which are transposers. Yeah, uh, and then two imposers. One is uh, cognates, uh, and then the other one is uh, loan loan words slash foreign transcriptions. Right. Uh, so then the question is, are where do we expect to see evidence of S and do we get S there? Yeah. And in Shaysheng series, S is not kept track of. But what I mean is, yeah. just suppose when you say the argument that yeah. there was no S yeah. in, at this stage of Chinese. Yeah. Instead, they had some kind of uh, H at the end. Yes. And uh, in this case, just the best thing they could do to write an S. Then you could see oh, I see. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. it's actually H or S or something. Uh, yeah, I don't know of any. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, let me just paraphrase, which is say, uh, it, I've shown evidence that when Chinese people heard foreign S's, they used uh, Chusheng characters to write those morph those syllables. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but that doesn't really say that uh, they. they, they in Chinese, it ended with an S. All that's saying is whatever the Chinese syllables ended in was the best available match to a foreign S. Maybe it was a, a sha or a H or a S. Yeah. Uh, what you really want is the barring the, the other way from Chinese into uh, 
and alphabetically uh, represented. Well, uh, I'm language. actually thinking of yeah. uh, one. Yeah. The word for uh, ten thousand, where you reconstruct an S, but the carrier doesn't show. It. Doesn't have it. Yeah. So of course there's program behind my question. Yeah. But because if you if you look at this, it, it really seems that there should be an S really. Yeah, but yeah. Please find that I think uh, we learned early enough that uh, they all go early enough. And then we learned far. Yeah, what is early enough? Well, yeah. So, I mean, let's say this gets into technical mm -hmm. language in each of the languages that are relevant, right? So maybe Tokari borrowed the S and then later lost it through sound chain. Uh, I don't, you know, this is beyond my ken. Yeah. Um, what I would say is, uh, unless we have a reason to reconstruct something other than S, we can stick with S for the time being, right? Like knowing that it's not that 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 you know maybe it was some voiceless fricative, yeah, um, and probably not an S, yeah, <laughs> uh, and and uh, and and for my purposes, then an S in reconstructions means. A voiceless fricative that's probably not an F. Yeah. Um, I think for, for for now we can say that, right? But I but that is a good point. And uh, and uh, let's say maybe one of you wants to write your paper about uh, Chinese loan words into foreign languages that have S in them. Now the trouble is, you know, if you if you head east, loans into Vietnamese, loans into Hmong, Mian, so, I don't think any of those places could would keep the S. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's going to be, you know, it's like, oh, I don't know, maybe really early loans into Japanese, but I think there's like only two or three that are old enough and they just happen not to be in the right syllables types. Yeah. So it would be hard to, I mean, uh, but, it's, but it's worthwhile. Uh, actually, I say probably the best evidence to look at. Is these uh, Central Central Asian, you know, Silk Road languages? Yeah, um, maybe Turkic. I don't know, uh, but it's a good point. Yeah. So uh, moving on, and, and now I move from the kind of most secure to something that's like totally speculative that I just came up with while I was uh, while I was preparing the slide, uh, which is we have these two spellings of uh, of uh, Greece. I think it's Greece. Yeah. 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 And uh, and actually, they're mentioned in the literature as being uh, the question being why do we write the ya the foreign ya with the middle nasal? And uh, it would be you know natural for me to now say the answer, but I don't know. And um, and we don't use that fact uh, for doing anything in old Chinese reconstruction. It's just a kind of a weird thing. Uh, and I'm not going to it to, to just you know show you weird things. But in fact, what I think is interesting is the variation between the earlier spelling uh, that uh, didn't have, that was two characters, and the later spelling that was three characters. And that probably in this time period, in the Western Pond, this was actually I. And then later, it, uh, it, it changed to A. So, so if they're trying to write this love, well, here they write the love of the love, right? But I'm wondering whether this off glide in the in the in the in the Western pond uh, was somehow representing the final L, yeah. and then that might be evidence of the off glide. And if you were someone like Jonathan Shanson, it might be evidence that the off glide is an L, yeah. as for him, like where Baxter and Cigar, Baxter and Cigar write this as a J. Uh, Schutzler writes it as an I, which is why you see it as an I here. But John von Schanfeld thinks it was originally an L. And that's for reasons to cognates in, in, in foreign languages. But I ran across this and I said, oh, you know, this, this is something that if I were John von Schanfeld, I would point to as evidence that, uh, that, 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 that Chinese had a final L, so that old Chinese had a final L, and that, that he, John von Schanfeld, is right that it's a final L and not a final L. Although the, exactly the same, you know, our argument that you just made, which is actually you're just showing that they have something that they use for writing the final L, and that would probably and yeah would be fine, right? Uh, well, so if yeah. you look at well, if you're coming from that L is nicer than J, or 
Yeah, totally. Uh, right. But most people think, uh, including me, that um, that reconstructing uh, this this off light as an L uh, in order to make sinus to bed comparisons look better is not yeah, that's really forbidden. Yeah, that's forbidden. Yeah, and like uh, it, at some point, you know, way back, it, it was probably an L at least some of the time. Like in 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 my reconstructions. Of, of let's say protosine of Tibetan, and protosine of Tibetan had a final ya, a final r, and a final l. And then uh, Tibetan lost the ya, and Chinese changed the la into a, into a ya. That's what I think happened, because that's what the court, it, it looks like a three way correspondence happened. Um, but that's not what John Chonkin does. He says all Chinese just had l, uh, and that l goes straight back all the way. Yeah. But anyhow, I just thought this was. I don't know this this variation. Uh, I, I think also just because it is a variation historically, right? There's like the same word gets written two different ways, uh, or at least slightly different ways, uh, with a couple under your part. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then uh, just because I think it's sort of mean somehow to only look at the West. Uh, we can do this, you know, in the east as well, uh, where there's an island uh, in, in the Japanese uh, archipelago, uh, which is called Iki, and it is written as Iki in the Han uh, period. And I don't know what that T is doing there, uh, but uh, the uh, point is that the K had not yet powerized, whereas, whereas this K. Uh, Powellized is quite early. It's the, the case powellized before the, you know, we could say uh, chronologically before uh, the dentals do. Uh, so we know from this case that, uh, well, that whenever this book was written in the early, uh, in the, in, yeah, let's say in the West, um, that uh, that K and all yeah, powellized. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and that's what I just said. Uh, and then this is uh, an art, the article by Axis Schussler, where he collects all these, um, uh, all, all these historical um, forms that I presented uh, some of uh, to you just now. Yeah. Okay, so that was it for Western Han historical sources. And now I'm turning to the Bailanga, uh, which uh, was written in this in this specific period, you know, between 58 and 75 CE. Um, and uh, the circumstances, once again, I said this, I think, uh, two days ago or something, but was uh, uh, the, some, some uh, Southern barbarians wanted to pay tribute, uh, and they came and they said, here's your tribute, and we also have uh, a dance we'd like to perform for you. You know, ethnic minorities are very good at dancing, uh, they always have been, they still are today. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> you can see that in the, the opening ceremony for the 2008 Olympics, for instance. Um, and uh, so they offer these, these, these peons to how great the Chinese are. Yeah, in, they, in a kind of song and dance. They have a song and dance routine, and the emperor loves it. He says, these Bailon, they have such great songs and dances. I want this to be recorded for posterity. So the the three poems are then uh, written down you know, with Chinese characters, but in the Bailan language, and then also translated into Chinese. And this gets preserved in a commentary on the Hohanshu, I think. Uh, but in any case, I've written an article about it, and you can check all the details there. Now, this is really what, what's the Latin phrase, obscurum obscurantum, or something. Uh, you know, the only thing we know about Bailong is these three poems, which are written with Chinese characters. So <laughs> using them to interpret Chinese uh, pronunciation is going to be an uphill battle. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now let's do it. So uh, it looks like, uh, which is no surprise, S before nasal clusters had already simplified because. This word uh, means meat. And uh, if 
it was pronounced sa, it compares very well with the Tibetan sha and Burmese sa and miso sa. Uh, but if it was pronounced sna, then it doesn't compare very well with them at all. Yeah. So we think uh, also it's just clear for all kinds of reasons that these these kind of like uh, S clusters had simplified by that time, but here's a piece of concrete evidence they had. Yeah? Uh, but here's an interesting example where it looks like this had not happened before L yet. Yeah, and I think this is, I don't know, I don't, I don't think these are widely held views. This is from my article about the Bailon Go. Yeah? Um, but but it, it's nice. The Bailon Go really helps us kind of slice between different, you know, must be before this, must be after that. Yeah. So why do I think that? Because this uh, slum becomes zim in Middle Chinese. But uh, if we compare it to the Burmese word uh, for warm, uh, it's lum. So I think probably the, the Bailan word was slum and not zim, right? Um, OK. Is there any S in the Burmese? I mean, or clearly? Uh, um, Burmese cannot have SL clusters. Um, but, uh, you know, look, uh, Bailan isn't going to be for me, right? So, so we have to allow ourselves a lot of leeway because we don't know anything about Bailan. Uh, so, but, I mean, it could also be Lung. Uh, uh, oh, it, so, so the Bailan word couldn't have been Lung uh, because then the Chinese would have chosen a character that was like Lung, not like Slung, right? Yeah, I think. Now, it could be that that S actually belongs to the preceding word or something like that, you know, in the poem. Yeah. Um, but in any case, I, I think, uh, what does it tell us about Chinese? I think it's strong evidence that Chinese had not yet changed slug to zo. Okay. Yeah. So we are assuming that Bailan is the verb of that language. Yeah. To those two persons. And do the characters also fit the synapse? So, like, this is clear. Is now assumption we do with that okay, so uh, so there's two questions in there, and one I understood and one I didn't. Before. One is, is it clear that Bailan is a Tibetan Burma language? Yeah. And I feel like the answer is yes. Right. Like that that you know we if 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 you look at the characters and what they mean, and you put those characters into anybody's reconstructions from anything around the right time period. The language is just obviously to better one. All right. So, so the characters, I, I, I want to talk about the methodology because that's looking like, okay, we assume this is pronounced like this. And in Burmese, this means warm. But if the character also means warm. No, the character does not mean warm. Oh. Like, uh, like this word. So we have to guess the meaning. No, we don't guess the meaning. We look at the meaning by looking at the Chinese translation. Ah, yeah. The translation. Yeah. <laughs> the, we have the. Poems in Bailong and in Chinese. Yeah. That's easy. yeah. <laughs> now, now lining up the specific characters is is not totally trivial, but it's pretty trivial, right? right. For one reason, because there's a lot of Chinese loan words in it, because they're talking about China. They're saying, oh, China is so great. Yeah. And so they so then you see the word China in Bailong. And so 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 the the loan word, the Chinese loan word in Bailan give you a kind of matrix of, of uh, correspondences in locations, which make basically everything else slots right in. Yeah? Not to say that there, there, there are no mystery, there are serious mystery, especially in the, in the, in the, in the more morphological uh, stuff. Yeah? There's, there's like things that seem to be genitives or relativizers and whatnot, but, but we only have these three poems, and they're in written in you know the worst possible phonetic representation. Yeah. So I, I don't think Bailong studies is ever going to get very advanced. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, so uh, about this is about the L, right? Okay. So just some more observations. Uh, R has not yet changed to La, probably, because we have this word that means uh, spend the night somewhere. And uh, and uh, it, it would be lek in Middle Chinese, and it would be rak in sort of let's say late Old Chinese or early 
you know, or, or it's Han in Chinese, yeah. Uh, and then I think that compares very nicely with the Tibetan word for, sorry, for the old Burmese word for day, which is a Now, uh, there's also a good Tibetan cognate, but but I would have to go into Tibetan sort of phonology, so I'm not going to. Uh, but in Tibetan, it actually also means to stay overnight, yeah, and isn't the word for day. So, um, so I think that's nice. Uh, and then another example, piece of evidence that, that the rough, the rough is still a rough and not yet love. Uh, is that uh, the word for rain is uh, probably like rai. Uh, maybe maybe not. It was already calm, so then it was rua, yeah, and that matches for me is rua extremely well. Um, okay, uh, so uh, it's, it's all the laterals that you know that are fun, right? Um, so uh, l. Had already changed to ya in type B syllables uh, because uh, the word for home uh, is is yim, uh, and uh, in order to match very closely the Burmese in uh, rather than lin uh, lum or something like that, yeah. Uh, and I already gave this one. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, I didn't know. I, yeah, I'm just gonna mention it, it, that uh, la had changed the ya, but la had not changed the da. We get uh, type B uh, L's. Sorry, we get type A L's in Chinese writing by long L's. Uh, and I expected a slide about it right there, and it wasn't there. It's, I think it wasn't there, right? No. OK. Uh, so uh, this one of the big watersheds, as we'll see later, uh, is this uh, ah changes into u, and i changes into ah. So, so which? Morphemes have the fi final a ah in them uh, is you know switches from one class of morphemes to another class of morphemes, uh, and then I'm I'm using here the 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 traditional Chinese terminology for these kind of classes of uh, morphemes that have the same rhyme, uh, and and they're used kind of pan chronically in Chinese historical linguistics if you like. There's like there's words in the gabu and there are words in the ubu. And then, like, what was the pronunciation of the gubu? Well, that changes, and and is, and then you know they can split, and they can merge, and whatnot. But uh, it's sort of we can do a, a, a traditional kind of historical phonology has done sort of categories of words uh, without IPA representations, right? So um, that's what this what this term is in brackets. So the ah had not become u yet, uh, and we see this because there's just loads of great correspondence, right? So. Uh, sun, sa, uh, which corresponds to lahu, which is probably actually also sa, I don't know, lahu, uh, but it's written cha. Uh, then we have uh, sector, maybe this one's not so strong uh, compared to the face. Uh, mother, this one's really, you, know, you, you can't beat this, right? So uh, it was probably not my, it was, uh, sorry, it was definitely not mu. Uh, which is what all uh, changes into in middle Chinese, uh, but it was ma, yeah, and then salt, it, it was sa, it was not su, uh, and then some great comparison. These, of course, are not high. I don't think, uh, I think this is a vandalor salt. Um, but anyhow, uh, and I uh, had already changed, I think, to ah. Now, this is a problem, right? You, you, you think, well, wait, wait, wait. If, if I had already changed to a, uh, but a uh had not yet changed to u, then historically inherited i and historically inherited a's should merge. Right? Um, and I think it's a really easy problem to get around by just saying like, oh, they were two different kinds of a's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but I do think that, that Bailong is pointing to, uh, this is an interesting problem, yeah? Uh, so in these words, uh, the old Chinese has this this ya final, but uh, the Tibetan Roman cognates subjected by long in these words. So we have uh, uh, 
rain, which we've already seen for a while. Uh, and uh, lovely, I think, comparison with uh, Jacob Yaman, where it was snow, um, with this pop, uh, and then uh, a, some kind of relative visor piece of grammar, uh, which throughout Tibetan learning should be a pot and not a pie. Yeah. So it, it looks to me like uh, I had already changed to A uh, and that A uh, had not yet changed to U, which means that let's call it primary A uh, and secondary A uh, had to be uh, kept apart somehow in vowel quality or something. Um, but uh, who knows? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Schutzler uh, kind of makes this distinction in his common constructions of probably an a or something, yeah, versus an all, uh, and that will do my good job for me, I think. Yeah. So the a comes out as a, and the all comes out as b. Correct. Yeah. But the colors are right. Yeah, the colors are right. Yeah. And then actually, that's interesting. Uh, we, we can say we can say maybe there was something going on in Bailon that they were that they were capturing these two that, that they were capturing with this distinction that they had in Chinese. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I've been treating them as as, as Bailon has up in both cases. Yeah. And uh, the location of this language probably they they say something about it. It's like I, I you know. Now I'm sort of worried about recording, but you and I think you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they're they're kind of traditionally considered to be E because you just call everyone from Yunnan E. <laughs> uh, but but, but in, in the in the way that happens with sort of nomenclature in China, like uh, these like like in let's say in classical Chinese, E just means uh, barbarian from the South, right? Today, E is a, you know, legally recognized uh, nationality, uh, but as the, the category it is today, that was invented uh, through the long arm of the state in, you know, 1955, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, and, and actually the E is a particular, particularly messy thing because, uh, let's say there's about eight closely related Lolo Burmese languages that are classified as E, but equally closely related Lolo Burmese languages are not classified as E. <laughs> so, so there, there's a uniquely bad map, not that. It's one of the worst maps between, uh, like the mapping, I should say, between linguistic reality and uh, official uh, ethnic classification in China. Um, so I don't want to say that they spoke E, because <laughs> yeah. it would be a meaningless thing to say. Uh, uh, well, you could say that maybe they spoke a Lolo Burmese variety. Now, the question is, uh, how can you tell? Right. So what I will say is, uh, is, is I'm happy to say that Bailon was Burmo Changit, which is kind of uh, one level up from Lolo Burmese, uh, and and has Lolo Burmese Changit and Gyalong inside. Uh, which would say I'm quite agnostic about that. And the only reason I would say that is because in looking for cognates, I found it quite easy to find them in Gyalong and Burmese compared to in Tibet. Right. If I could find a cognate in Tibetan, I could also find it in Burmese, but the reverse was not the case. So it sort of seems lexically closer to uh, the Burma Chongic languages than to uh, Tibetan in any case. Uh, but I don't think we're, this is one instance, I don't think we're going to do a lot better than that because there's only, you know, like what, 50 morphemes or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, anyhow, that's. It's not, uh, it's not very much. It's a, it's a poem and it's, you know, it's a verb final. Um, you know, they have a pa. There, <laughs> there. It looks like there, there's a ka and a da that are doing some morphological stuff. But you know, like I mean, I commend to you to study a bilingual. It's great, very little language. You can become one of the world's leading bilingualists uh, in you know a couple weeks. <laughs> How long is it? Uh, they're not long. They're they're like uh, three four stanzas and four lines, and there are three poems.
Um, yeah. So how do you write a scheme? What is the character for? What for the it's, people that are for the scheme? Mm -hmm. Oh Lord. Um, that's there's uh, there's there's this so so uh, so there's a character that I do not feel sufficiently competent to, to write on a board, which is the traditional character for West for Southern Barbarian. Uh, but then in the national classification project, uh, they decided that one was slightly too pejorative. Uh, so they used another character, is, I think is what's going on. But if you just say, you know, wiki E people, uh, you'll see it. Yeah. And hopefully see a nice objective, detailed discussion of the, you know, of the history of it. But, but also like, I mean, just to say, this is a thing that happened, right? So like the Chong are another group, the Chong. So, Chong uh, also is just historically just a word for kind of Western barbarian, right? They, I mean, the, the throughout Chinese history, it's like, well, the capital is sort of where the capital is, and then they just had words for sort of barbarians over there and barbarians over there. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, at some point, those get mapped onto a specific ethnic group. So the Chong are another example where there are people who are called Chong. And then the kind of default narrative in public discourse in China is, oh, they're the Chang, you know, the same ones in the in the Zhou Dynasty and in the Tang Dynasty. You know? It's ridiculous. Right? Anyhow, uh, so that was it for the bylaw. Um, so now on to Indic transcriptions. So this first one is not so useful for us, but I wanted to throw it in there because it's super. Uh, it's like in Warren State's classes, yeah. And uh, my friends and uh, senpai uh, at Harvard, Hong uh, Tech uh, wrote uh, an article about it, uh, and it's some kind of works, yeah. Uh, and it comes up in Dallas texts, uh, and it does show that the A has in Dallas, yeah, uh, like that, yeah. And then here's a citation of this article, but that's just to say. There's one Indic loan word that's really quite old. Okay. Then we have uh, th this, this one text in the title of Pratika, uh, which is T731, which looks like it's Western Pond. And this is an observation pointed out uh, by Angela Colombo. It's not widely, I mean, I think he's been telling people about it, uh, but uh, it's not sort of totally incorporated into Chinese studies or Buddhist studies. Uh, that there's this one text that's um, sort of the, the earliest Chinese Buddhist text we have, uh, and it has these hell names in it. Yeah, and in these hell names, you will notice that old Chinese ah uh, is still being used for indic ah. Uh. It's not being used for indic u. Uh. So it, so that's you know one way we know this is a really old text. It also kind of feels like an old text. It's not very philosophical. It's telling people, you know, be good or you'll go to hell. Let me tell you about the different hells you'll go to. Um, uh, but anyhow, you see, let's just read one of them. So we have Sangata, uh, and then it's Sangyata, right? So uh, nice, yeah. Okay, then we have gotten, you know, with these two sort of preliminary slides out of the way, we get to kind of real Buddhist history. Which are the Han Dynasty Buddhist translators, uh, and these are Eastern Han. So on, on Zhigao, uh, he was uh, the first Chinese translator, and then Lo Chang, who was the second one, and then Tang Meng Xiang, who was the third one. These guys are all Central Asians. Uh, uh, let me see if I remember if it says here. Does it say here that? Uh, So I think, gosh, yeah, so Gid Sakyan and Kang means Sakyan, and then An means Parthian, and then Zhu means Tokeran. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, so we know where they're from. Although I think Kang was from a, uh, he's, he's a, you know, what, what, what he would have a hyphenate. He's, he wasn't a Sakyan, he was a, a, a Sakyan Chinese. He was, he was from a family that had already been in China for a while. Um, but so they're all Central Asians, and um, their approach to Indic terminology was quite different, with the extremes being look at Shema, really like to write the, the Indic words. 
So let me let me give you an example from sort of Buddhist hybrid English. Uh, I can say something like dependent arising, or I can say pratikya samutpada, or I could say the awakened one, or I could say Buddha. Right? Uh, so you know, people translating uh, books for a popular audience in English today have this concern, you know, in English, they had it in China, uh, and Lokak Shema liked to leave things uh, in it, and Kong uh, liked to, to translate everything, uh, whereas Anshar Gao was in a kind of intermediate position. So now, uh, let's look at their transcriptions. Oh, and then this is, uh, this material I, I, I presented before the conference, and so I'm also just going to vaunt a little bit and say, We've made a data set of this material, and our data set is bigger than Kaufman's. Yeah. Uh, so, so he had uh, 33 Entregal uh, inscript uh, uh, data points, and we have 75, uh, and uh, he had 257, and we have 280 for Lokashima, and then we have the same for, for Kaufman. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this is slightly out of date because Julian, uh, who's close talk on the project, has been. Uh, Combing through yet more look of Shema, and I think he has a, a, another 200 or something like that. Although, how many of them are repeats, we don't quite know. So, anyhow, this is, and now you're getting the sense that, you know, as we move forward in time, of course, it's sad because Chinese phonology is changing. So, we're not getting information about the good old times. But on the other hand, we're getting more information, and that's good, right? Uh, so, um, yeah. So just notice that uh, the Indic language that these gentlemen were translating from seems to be Gandhari. Yeah? And um, that's something that was sort of noticed, was speculated about even before we had very much Gandhari, and then was sort of noticed starting in the 90s, but uh, still has the feeling of being like a new, new and exciting idea to me, at least, right? Because I you know, was already alive in the 1990s. <laughs> but uh, uh, but actually, it's kind of obvious if you just look at the Gandhari forms and the um, Chinese form. And here, I'm just pointing out that the sibilants match uh, very closely. So uh, let's just—I mean, you can see they're in bold, right? So we have uh, so we have here in um, like uh, like in Sanskrit, we have a here in Pali, it's just a sa, mm. but in Gandhari, it's a shra, and then in uh, Schuster's uh, like uh, on Chinese, it's shra. Yeah, so a uh, very nice match with Gandhari on the sibilants. Okay, and then, um, That's, sorry, question about the previous slide. Yeah, what is uh. What's Ramana? So what, what do we do with the eye? And, and, uh... Oh, I'm giving these eyes because this, you know, because if I didn't put the eye in, this would not be Schutzler's late on Chinese reconstruction, but the eyes would not, right? Because we were just saying I changes into A, it had already happened uh, in the Bailanga. So now we're post Bailanga, so they're gone. Right? Yeah. Um, and this is a, for uh, Ashai. There, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That also bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and then I'll just point out that this is the difference, right, between. Uh, let me go, just go back to this 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 super old one, right? These are in Chinese terms. These as. Uh, are being written with characters from the uh, from the Yugu, right? But these oh, are sorry. yeah. Can you go back to this uh, super? Yeah, yeah. This Mahma uh, Abuchi. Yeah, the French write with uh, Max, but that stands for the thing otherwise known as S or. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the thing is, I'm playing all sorts of tricks on you in order to make it easier, because uh, actually this should be a KS in, okay. in old Chinese. But then I thought you might say, well, maha as maksa doesn't seem right, yeah? 
Uh, so, so I sort of was tacitly saying, ah, probably at this time, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to make it up on the slide, right? Uh, uh, it's actually comes back to what we were saying before. When they wanted to write S's, foreign S's, they never use, I'm, I'm talking about like Western Hong, Western Hong, uh, yeah, they never used KS. So it seemed like KS, you know, maybe it was never KS, but was, but maybe had changed into something like K, uh, yeah. Um, that's, you know, uh, so I was trying to make it look more plausible as a transcription. Uh, but then I was kind of sneaking some things on the road. Right. Well, that would be plus x. The yeah, that's so. Yeah. yeah. And actually, like, what I'll, I'll tell you what, what Schutzler actually does is he says that, that um, let's say this is back to cigar. This is Schutzler. So Baxter and cigar have ox and ox. Yeah. And Schutzler says this one's fine. But this one I don't like because it's never written S in foreign sources. So he writes it like this. Yeah. Uh, where it's some kind of you know voice descriptive. But I think this is not going to work. Uh, and the reason why don't I think it's going to work? It has to do with the relative chronology of the sound changes. And will I be able to remember what it is? Uh, no, I don't. But but uh, Schussler needs some some funny sound changes uh, in order for things to work out right. Uh, so I think it's probably uh, better to say something like this and then and then this. Yeah. So, yeah. What is X supposed to be? A field yeah. They, 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 it all ends up dropping. Like, like, like these all end up as, as just, uh, I, this is, I'm right at it, you know, I would want to double check this, but I think ox in middle Chinese ends up as ox or ox or ah. Uh, yeah, because it's a high comment. Uh, whereas ox uh, ends up as, uh, as ice. Uh, and then as, oh, I forget the details. But anyhow, the, 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 it ends up being indexed as a distinction in the rhyme, yeah. And then I think some of those um, changes uh, just kind of work better if, if we didn't have this. And I also just think it's weird, right? Like what you, you, you had, you had a, a, a voice, you had a, you had a aspirate auslaut, like, I know that's not, you know, the weirdest thing in the world, but it's pretty weird. Yeah. Usually you don't distinguish. You know, you don't, yeah. It would also be the only one. But... Yeah, it would also be the only one. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, I mean, and this is a sort of, there's a, there's a kind of um, question of what counts as elegant to different people, right? Where like Baxter and Cigar want symmetry and phonological plausibility, where Trusco wants kind of phonetic accuracy with the actual uh, primary sources. And I think that's a, a tension in Chinese historical phonology. And that it's important actually to have some people who go way too far one way and way too far the other way and really keep talking about it. But anyhow, that's why I made that answer. I was because I wanted to make it seem plausible that it was right in Maha. Um, but yeah, the, the point here is uh, these are inherited as, which would later become u, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and and that's called the ubu. Uh, whereas with these gentlemen, uh, they're not using the ubu, they're using the, the gogu, which is this i, but was clearly off by that time. Yeah? So that's, that's nice. We have this real, like, kind of Western Han, it was like this. Eastern Han, it had changed to this. Uh, so, yeah, these are just some more nice, not some nice matches with the Dari. So we have Ch and Ch, right? So those match. And we have Ya matching with Ya. Uh, 
uh, whereas and the point is like Sanskrit has other stuff going on. Okay, this tia and the ja and whatnot. So very nice match with Gandhari. So we can definitely feel like using Gandhari is is what we should do here. Yeah, unfortunately, Gandhari applications aren't available for other words. Uh, and I'm not in a position to make up Gandhari words based on the Sanskrit, although we may ask some colleagues to do that. Oh, this is what I was just I was just mentioning. Yeah. So uh, old Chinese I in the Ubu has this way and in the A, and there's a bunch of examples. You already seen what it's about. Now, one thing I find really weird that I it's as far as I can tell, no one has commented about in the Han period is um Chinese final T for Indic R. So you get uh, this uh, Sagara written as Sa uh, Yat and this uh, Divankara as Deoan Yat. Yeah. Now, in uh, later forms of Chinese, this is uh, by which I mean Tang Dynasty, uh, this is totally normal that a final T would write. Uh, the, the final T had developed into R in uh, what we call old, old Northwest Chinese. So basically, Tang Dynasty Chinese spoken at the capital of Chang'an, they they had changed their final T to final R's. Which is a slightly strange thing, but the evidence for it is totally overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, but at this early period, it's very strange. And most of their R's, they don't write with T. Right? Most of the R's, they write with LUDs, yeah, initial LUDs. Yeah. So, you know, so please tell me what it means. Yeah. Uh, but Chinese T for Indic T is also very common. Yeah. So here are examples of that. We have uh, we have like this Chakravarti is uh, Chakai Wat. Yeah. So we're not able to say that Chinese had you know that it, that it's, it's that we need to date that T that R change and have it in Han much earlier. That's definitely not the right move because they're using uh, their own T for both foreign T and foreign R. You could have said things about fake R that is that the rose in T while there was flat. Yeah. But yeah, that's a that's a nice idea. I mean, generally speaking, we think that these final us are oh no, I was gonna say, yeah, like uh, uh, what is it? In, in Indo Aryan languages, love to drop short final up, uh, but uh, and I think that already does it. But here's, a, here's one that is there, so um, you know, maybe, a, yeah, maybe that's something to consider. Anyhow, um, and then evidence for S. Now, you say, weren't we just talking about this? Yes, we were, but we were talking about evidence from Western Han historical texts, and, and now we're talking about evidence. From Eastern Han Buddhist text, yeah. So uh, Baranasi, nice S. Uh, Shavasti, nice S at the end. Uh, and then I will point out uh, this. I'll talk about it a little bit uh, because Holy Wang, in the article that he proposed that the Chushan was an S, uh, knew about this one, but we didn't have the Gandhari at that point. And he was like, ah, Samadhi, ah, close enough to an S. Yeah. Uh, but then it turns out that Gandhari just has an S. Right? So then this, the match with Samadhi is extremely uh, good. So, um, yeah, and then this is just some more from my third guy because it didn't all fit on my screen. Okay. But now some evidence against S. Now I I I am not suggesting that I doubt S. I think uh, I I don't I don't. But uh, this is weird, right? So uh, we have Nigroda. I don't see an S in Nigroda. Now maybe the problem is I'm missing the Gandhari, uh, and we just saw an example of Gandhari writing the as S. So. Maybe the problem is just that I'm missing the Gandhari. But in the case of Kuru, I have the Gandhari. And so I wonder why have they put an S there? Right. Okay. Um, now, evidence against S from Loka Chema. Here are some more examples. Uh, we saw Avicii before, right? Avicii is a hell. Uh, and here we have 
with an S thing. Why? I don't know. There's something going on here. And one thing I'll mention is that it could be focus points, right? So uh, let's look at Avicii, actually, uh, which in Gandhari is Avidi, is the lemma in the Gandhari dictionary. And Abis doesn't look so good, uh, but it's uh, in the, I guess, direct, I don't know. I don't know anything about Gandhari yet. But it, one of the case forms is Avicii, so, 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 you know, cha matching with sa is at least better than matching with ya, right? Uh, so it could be some case forms. And then uh, I found this case form that gets me my S in, um, in uh, which word was it? Was it Avibhakti? No, yeah, it was Avibhakti. Yeah, so we have Avibhakti in, uh, in Gandhari. But in, in uh, the genitive, it's ave vashis, ave vakiasa. So uh, that would actually look great, ave vakiasa, right? Uh, but of course, if I start using genitives to give me acid, I can get them anywhere I want, right? And so um, <laughs> we would really need a close philological scrutiny of like is presuming a genitive in the for logger here, uh, you know, does it make sense? Is, is it is it uh, yeah? So there's work to be done there, but but I it gives me a little bit of hope, right? That like yeah, we have some essence we don't want, but maybe there are ways we can get rid of them. A uh, question: What is uh, Gantari? Is it an early Prakrit spoken in Kandahar, Afghanistan? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you you nailed it. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's also the the language that has the er earliest extant Buddhist stuff in it. Yeah, second century CE, I think, which is you know right at our time. Yeah, that's where the Chinese definitely got their Buddhism from Gandhara. Yeah, across the Silk Road. I see. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's just number instead. Okay, so now uh, evidence for final R. You know, final R is one of the controversial points. So let's look at final R. Uh, it's it's not lovely. Yeah. So uh, I'm turning to now a slightly later guy, Zhe uh, Qian, who we haven't collected from, but I just found this in the secondary literature. So there you go. Uh, this character, this one, uh, is used for two syllables. In this guy's work, one is bin and one is bit. Now, the reason that we reconstruct final R at all, it's Starostin's idea, is this uh, it's kind of contact between N and Y, where you know he thinks let's let's uh, let's write it down. So old Chinese on days on old Chinese. I, we know, changes into ah, uh, and then old Chinese R, he thinks in most dialects becomes un, but in some dialects becomes I, and then merges with inherent I. So, so we have in certain words, certain kinds of messy, uh, you know, uh, disappearing, reappearing ends and yas, and uh, that's the evidence for R. So, so here we have, we have something Smith and Alex, yeah. And now you say, well, well, why was Mister uh, Jurchen so inconsistent? Now, either he, his dialect of Chinese had R, uh, sorry, probably who didn't have R. It either had na in this word or it had no na. Uh, but uh, these are not. Uh, each of these translators should be understood as a the like foreman on some kind of team. So maybe you know one guy uh, was from a region where they changed R into Ya, and one guy was from a region where they changed uh, R into Na. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, I don't know what you make of this evidence, but um, I wanted to give it to you. Yeah. Well, it works quite complex. Don't, don't you think of it as kind of uh, team? Somebody speaking. And I was like, there's a lot of people writing Chinese, and maybe 
to be more brighter. Oh yeah, it was yeah. a mess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and then done at breakneck speed too, usually because they were trying to you know win souls. Yeah. Um, all I'm saying is like, if you if you're in the the R half, you know the the if you that's a the R camp. There we go. If you're in the in the in the camp of people who want there to be an old Chinese R, you would look at this and say, yeah, that's evidence for uh, old Chinese R. Uh, and then interestingly, actually, Baxman said, well, reconstruct an N, but they're allowing R as possible. So, like, you know, if if you really want it to be to squeeze as much blood out of the stone as possible, you could say, because Zhe Chen is inconsistent in his use of this character for uh, final N. We can change this into an R in Old Chinese. Yeah, I th I think that would be a little bit rash, but I but I want to, but I'm looking for this kind of evidence, so I wanted to give it to you. Right? Uh, if I'm final R is I think or where and when and whether to reconstruct final R is is where is where that action is in <laughs> in the old Chinese historical chronology right now, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Now Baxman Cigar actually turned to look at Shema as evidence for reconstructing final R in their book, and they use this word as their example, yeah, which is a bus, and they don't read it. Well, that's the, that's the syllable we're worried about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Schriftler doesn't reconstruct it, so I can't give it in Schriftler's reconstruction. Yeah. Uh, but they uh, think that it was, you know, something like swat. Yeah. The problem here is that this piece of evidence is totally isolated and way, and generally speaking, way too late. You, you know, we, we looked at R in Western Han, and then there was some quite strong evidence and some ambiguous evidence. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, this is too late, I think. Uh, and even in his own corpus, if we look at what by which I say look at Shema, if we look at other characters from the same Shishan series, the Baxman cigar also reconstruct the final R, they are consistently with N. Yeah. So here's another character, and we get bunny. We don't get raw. Uh, here is uh, uh, and then I went and got the evidence together, and uh, and here's here it is. Uh, it looks like uh, it looks like I mean you could say part of not this you know but no it was it was the R's were not there in Andari. so so I think that uh, in Loka Chema's milieu uh, certainly R had finally had changed into final N uh, in for those people who made that change and for those people who changed it to final Yah it had changed to final Yah. So I don't know what to do then with this piece of evidence that they give here, uh, except where is it? Yeah, here, because he is using it to uh, to transcribe uh, an R here, right? So maybe I'll know when I know what the Gandhari is. Maybe it will be a Y. No, I don't think it will be an N. So anyhow, now you've seen the evidence. Yeah, and then I'll just uh, uh, point out, speaking about specific. You know, characters. We saw this character in the Western Han data uh, for the Abars. So there, you know, if if you don't want to believe that, you could say, "Oh, N was the closest thing they had." But I think it's pretty strong. But Logan Chamber uses it for for fun. So uh, so this is where I'm saying, mm, you know, gentlemen, back from cigar. I generally agree with your reconstruction of final R, but let's not bring Logan Chamber. Um, so that was it for my discussion of R, and then I'll just say a problem in, uh, or a problem, interesting phenomenon in local Chema is inconsistent transcriptions of the same uh, thing in the Indic form, right? So here we have Avarajita, where he says, ah, oh, but I'm going to make that a P, Avarajitai. Uh, but here, Divankara, uh, he says, I'm going to do a lot. Yeah. So I don't, it doesn't bother me very much, but interesting. Yeah. Um, and the Pali, I, I don't have it up here. Oh, the Sanskrit has a Pali. Yeah. And so does 
So, so maybe in some cases they knew the Sanskrit, or who knows? Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, I think an interesting phenomenon that uh, V is being inconsistently transliterated. And then another phenomenon that I think is just interesting that no one has commented about, as far as I know, is using G, G for che or J, uh, which suggests that it kind of lies. Uh, well, the, the question I have is why would you use uh, a historical D? Like, why would you use? Oh, okay, so uh, yeah, exactly. why wouldn't you use did, which comes out as j, right? Which comes out as j. That's what I would done. So I think there's something peculiar about it in any case. Yeah. Um, yeah, still so again, back to the uh, Indo Aryan loans. Yeah. Oh, Chinese, we talk about they have the horse and the chariot words, right? Yeah. I mean, like just from my mere understanding of phonology, I feel like. It might work, but my concern is like the time. I feel like, do you have like, you know, a good story for the sort of like the approximate date when these two words have been loaned into Old Chinese? So I feel like to me, the logograms of horse and chariots, uh, I, I think someone else uh, in the chat also brought that up uh, earlier, that it looks really basic. It looks like super old to me because I feel like, you know, the chariot just looks like the shape of a chariot and also also the horse. Well, while compared with, you know, uh, the honey, the character for honey, it looks like more derived. And I mean, I accept that it might be loaned or borrowed in from uh, to carry in like much later. And also you have so many characters that is sort of like derived based on the, the chariot and the horse character. So, you know, that's kind of like my concern. Like, do you have a good story for- Yeah, but like, the, 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 what I would say is you're right that they're extremely early, but it's no problem. Because Indo Aryan was right. in the early. And the, the, in terms of the archaeological record, um, the early Shang does not have the horse and chariot. Uh, and the horse and chariot are introduced basically in the archaeological record exactly in, at, in 1250 BC, which is when right. writing starts. Yeah. Uh, right. And we also know that this is when uh, a, the, the Andronovan, I think, culture was in contact with the Chinese. And that, and that, you know, the story we have is basically that you have Indo Aryans who were down in as far as the Hurrians were, were I mean, I, I'm really out of my comfort zone here, but I, the Hurrians were run by the Mitannis, right? And the Mitannis were Indo Aryan speakers also at this time. So, so there's like, so we have people with the right, uh, the, there's also a question of the particular type of chariot and the particular type of chariot found in. Shang Dynasty tombs is the sort of specifically Indo Aryan chariot. It has to do right. with its axle. Uh, I don't know that literature very well. So I think you have the right type of chariot in the right place at the right time, and it's perfect. And I'll also, you know, just to say something super mm -hmm. controversial, uh, I also think that it's not a coincidence that writing was introduced at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I see. Um, and also, I mean, that question might be, you know, you know, my next question might be a too bit of a stretch, but do you have like a, any idea of like the, <laughs> the actual like geographic location for, you know, the contact that happens? Because uh, Tocharians sort of like contact with the, uh, with the Han, with the Chinese people much later on. And what about like Indo Aryans? Like what might you know, be- No, it would have been the Shang, it would have been the mid Shang. Yeah, what, what might be like the place? Do, do you know, oh, no, in, 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 in Yinshu, right? Like, right. That's where the Shang were. I see. It's ah uh, okay. Yeah, because I I have like this idea in my mind that you know it must be like trading or somewhere that happens like between you know the Indian no 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 and Chinese no, no. Culture. I mean I'll actually say you know I think Lady who Lady who is it or Lady Fu the, the 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 only kind of complete excavation of a Shang Dynasty tomb was this <laughs> was this wife I think of Wu Ding yeah. I think so, it, yeah. It has a complete chariot in it. So we like we know that and and she like let's say she may have been because she's a foreign bride, maybe. So I think maybe she mm -hmm. was Indo Aryan. Yeah. So we actually like mm -hmm. I think the, the archaeological circumstantial evidence could not be better. 